All right, cool, 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 cool. So look, I'm just, I'm still worried about connection. But in any case, look, um, we back. It's Dr. E's Open Seminar. You all know what it is. It's Open Seminar number 47 today. We 47 seminars in. Obviously, today's a Friday. We're usually here on a Monday, same time, same place. Usually every Monday, 7 p.m. EST, uh, GMT, sorry, 2 p.m. EST. So that's for your East Coast, New York, wherever else is people's, all our family out there, what's up? Um, but yeah, 7 p.m. GMT, 2 p.m. EST. You know what we do every single week, bring the education for a new generation, the kind of expertise you usually have to pay through the nose for. Seeing those dry ass lecture theaters with those crossy old white men. But we bring it a different way, you know what I'm saying? We bring in that kind of conversation. They would never kick in those schools and those institutions and what have you. We tell you the things that, like, you know, they would just never tell you. And we make us, you know, we fly in the process, I'm just saying. But in any case, I'm your boy, Dr. E. Not my eyebrows, not today. I mean, I don't know why you keep drawing attention to it. I'm your boy. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking at my no eyebrows. Horrible. I'm your boy, Dr. E. Director and lead tutor of TBT. Philosopher, philosopher extraordinaire. All those wonderful things right there. That's your girl, Tanzine. The great dictator, PhD to be. Yo, what's up, T? And of Vote for me in the dictator elections, guys. Vote for Tanzine in the dictator elections, obviously. My plan. Take all the wealth and make it easy. That's, I mean, that's a plan. I don't know if it, we'll, we'll talk about this. But the point is, shout out C in the background, Kareen in the background doing all of our background work. Not this week, but Kareen's got like, she's hey, got work. She out work to do. She, she leveling up right now. So she out there studying, getting herself leveled up. Da, da, da. She got some exams, so good luck good with man. that. Shout her out. Uh, and Missy doing all of our edits. So y'all know we usually turn up on a Friday, on a Monday. We usually turn up on a Monday. We do our seminars on a Monday, 7 p.m. and say GMT, 2 p.m. EST. And then we get the edited version of the seminar. It turns up on a Saturday on YouTube. Y'all can check out the edits. And Missy does all of our edits. So shout out, Missy. We love you um, for doing all of that work. And of course, now Missy's got mad work to do tonight and tomorrow because it's got to be uploaded for, for Saturday. And it's Friday today. What's up? Um, so you know Missy's loving this one. You know Missy's loving this one. I feel like, you know, we also do is like drive her crazy and just give me like a four hour seminar. Um, no. That will drive me crazy. What you trying to say? You want to talk to me four hours? Nope. All right. You understand nice. somewhere along the line in the course of your life, you made a decision, right? And what that decision meant was that- like, To marry you, I ask why every day. You kind of stuck <laughs> with like talking to me for like mad years now. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying. You see why I need space now? Cause I'm going to be trapped with this for the next three years or whatever it's going to be. Till we die. Just the, the, I just, I love it. It's cool. Listen, listen. In any case, the point is, so we want to continue the conversation from from the from forty six, right? So the the seminar that we ended up at forty six, we had our special guest Errol, shout out Errol, um, who was there for forty six. But in forty six, I mean Errol house right now yeah you're Errol's place right now doing this which is like i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and just blame Errol for whatever internet connections we have problems we have i'm not That's i know it's, it's got nothing to do with Errol, but like i gotta blame somebody is the internet back on no. is the internet back on no is it back on no it... but the point is what we are talking about is the stuff that we've kind of raised uh, like, to pick back off of where we left off of last week right so last week we kind of had this conversation about identity identity politics cancel culture da, da, da. we didn't really get into cancel culture that much but we had this conversation about identity da, da, da. and it was off the back of um a couple of Brian. lectures yeah it was off the back of what was happening in france and it was off the back of um a couple of seminars that we did on the issue of uh civil rights uh black power movement and what have you where we focused our attention for like four seminars on um leaders from 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 that movement over that time right mm -hmm. so that kind of led us to lessons from literature session which is what today is shout out lessons from literature but in any case let us to the lessons from literature session. And then it's like, all right, so what piece of literature we look at? And it seemed obvious, right? Franz Fanon. Well, we wanted to find on any at some point. We were going to do Fanon at any point. Yeah, don't. exactly. Yeah, true. We were going to touch on that at some point anyway. Okay. Um, but it, like this seemed like an appropriate time to, to, to have that conversation, and particularly in light of the stuff that we've been looking at in any case. But I want to say this at the outset, like before we even get into Fanon. Which is this, I was a little bit hesitant to get into this conversation um, or to have the fan of conversation, you notice, like I was, I was looking for the right moment, I was thinking about what the right time that we do the seminar. Da, 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 da. Because you overthink everything. Yeah. I'm a philosopher fan, that's, that's, it's, I think about everything, that's what I do, oh. it's called thinking. That's how I don't make mistakes. Um, but the point is, you, you know how you, make mistakes. 
No, far fewer. You know how you make you know how you make mistakes very real easy? You don't think about things. That's how you make mistakes. You, that's what that is. Making mistakes is not thinking about it before you do it. Overthinking is too much. But anyway, yeah. So you didn't want to you wanted to do Kanan, but you didn't want to do it because you thought too much. Well, no, it's it's because there's a, there's a question as to how to because I look, fandom means a lot to me, right? Um, Franz fandom means a lot to me personally, like just in terms of my personal upbringing, in terms of my life growing up, in terms of my education, in terms of my time at school, my experience as a refugee, my experience as, as a Muslim, my experience as a brown man in the United Kingdom as a majority white country. Um, I think particularly I was gonna say because you're in Europe and a lot of what yeah. you're about is the European experience. is the European experience. Yeah, exactly. It was it's a different thing. Like so when I read James Baldwin or when I read Malcolm X or when I read you know all of these people or Fanny Lou Hamer or whatever, when we were talking about these people, obviously I empathize, I sympathize, I understand, I'm on that side of what have you, all of the experiences they're talking about things that are very, very similar to, to, to my experience, but the fact that it's American and it's American centric has that slightly different nuance that just isn't always the case here. Yeah. Um, if not, if for no other reason than the fact that they're just the numbers, just the demographics aren't the same here. Mm -hmm. um, we're just a, a really tiny minority in the, in the United Kingdom, just across the country. Yeah. It's just what it is. So, and across Europe, really. Yeah, and across Europe, exactly. There isn't a single European country that's not majority white. I think Europe. I mean, in Europe, I think it's like France has the highest amount of immigrants, black and brown countries, followed by the UK. And then I think it's the Netherlands after that. Something, something I don't like know. But there is a many, but, but still the population of black and brown people are a really small percentage of the population. Yeah, because there isn't there isn't a, a, a population, there isn't a country in the European Union that isn't majority white. I mean, it's not an accusation. Right. It's just the case. So fair enough. The point is that France Fanon always, for that reason and for a whole bunch of others, always hit me a little bit harder. And I distinctly remember when I first read Black Skin White Master at university. Firm, like mm -hmm. that book changed my freaking life. Like it changed everything about the way I functioned, what I thought, what I believed, what I thought was true, what I thought was false. Everything changed off the back of this one book. Um, my my kid brother read it and cried for like a day or two, like just bust out crying. And it's just his ability to be able to like go into the deepest recesses of, of the m most insecure parts of your mind, pull that ish out yeah. and then phrase it eloquently on a page. You're like, yo, who is this person? What are you saying? How do you know this about me? So, when I first read Fanon, I was 17. The reason I read him at the age, I was high school. And the reason I read him was because I had a French teacher. So I was like real to like revolution, learning about world revolution, learning about decolonization. I was really into Cuba and I got really into Algeria and Morocco because I learned that there was such a big brown population in which for me, it always, I always grown up in France, in Europe, but particularly in France because there's just more brown people, there's just more Muslims. Growing up here, we're hard because the population is so small and we basically, we don't exist here. And I didn't like it. Um, and when I, I never knew what France was, I didn't know anything about France. And then I got in hip hop of my, my friend, my teacher, um, who was actually from Marigny, which is where Fanon is from. Mm. He from Marigny, grew up in Paris. And he, we used to always talk about hip hop. And then he got me into French hip hop. And I was like, amazing. I was like, six times. And then as I was learning more about French hip hop, I came across a movie called La Haine which is my, to this day, I have a quote from the end. You can't, but I have a quote from the end right here. Uh, because that movie is what changed my life. Yeah. In so many ways. And getting to the end and watching that and seeing that they had a Muslim Arab character and it was normal. Like, we actually exist. Like, in France exist. Like, not existent. Like, we are in the U.S. Um, it really changed me and then from there he told me about Fanon and he was like you would love Fanon you should read him so I I read about him first and I got really interested because um you know he was Martinique um went to, he was for university he went to the France the Paris and it was there that he met all these immigrants from other French um met Algerians there and this was at the time that the Algerian revolution was happening or it was the big the Algerian movement for for liberation and he got involved in it as a student um and he ended up moving to algeria 
living in Algeria, fighting in the revolution, it was like really, Fanon was always really interesting to me. He was kind of like an example me of what I, at that age, wanted to be like for my life. I was like, all right, gonna pick a country where revolution is happening, gonna go, gonna be like Fanon. <laughs> Like there were all these things, so I, I really always appreciate that about him. Um, but that's how I, when I first read Fanon, I was 17. I read Black King. Uh, I don't think I, at that age, could the language. Um, I understood some of the concepts because it's not hard to understand conceptually, but for me, the language was really difficult, and I don't know that I grasped it completely. Mm. I tried to reread it at I was like 26. And I read it, and I I, re, I I understood more, but I still wasn't quite there. Um, so I'm, you know, this is my third time rereading it um, as we're doing the seminars, and I'm really excited because I'm already picking up on things that I hadn't picked up on the first two times. Um, yeah. And to be honest with you, because the language was a bit difficult for me, I couldn't. I don't remember a lot of what I I, re, I remember some stuff. Like I remember the case studies that I did black woman with the white man and the the white man with the with, I'm sorry the black man with the white woman um I remember th those things but a lot of the other theoretical stuff because I was never good at theory and I'm still not but it was way over my head before so that's my whole thing with Fanon cool there you go end the seminar thank you guys very much we appreciate it peace no. yo that's the whole thing wrapped up no um yo you you run through the whole thing in five minutes fam all right but look Let's, let's let's break down everything you just said because there's a lot in what you just said mm -hmm. um <laughs> we, we might want to take this like step by step so f but before we get into it kind of like before we kind of you know really dig into to the introduction of, of black skin white moss which is what we're going to focus our attention on today um and for the preceding few seminars from on our lessons from uh from literature right so for every once a month every month we've got lessons from literature seminar in any case um and for the next few that lessons from literature is going to be dedicated to, to Franz Fan and, and black skin white masks. Um, mm. So we can kind of make our way through this text properly so we can understand this text properly so we can um, break it down and really take our time with understanding what it is that he's trying to say because there's a lot in here that's, I've, I've been rereading and there's a lot in here that's wildly controversial, like particularly today. So having said that, having said, not that I think it's controversial, but like, you know, people would think it's controversial. I think he's right on every single word he says, but that's something else. Having said all of that, mm. let me just say this at the outset, just to make mm. this abundantly clear at the outset. One, I am abundantly conscious of the fact that neither of us are black. I get that. Mm. Two, nothing that we're saying here is intended in any way, shape or form to offend, criticize, demean, judge, uh, accuse, um, whatever, assert, or anything about anyone. That's not what we're doing here. We've had this conversation in the past. We've had these kind of like, um, like these warnings ahead of time in the past, but I just feel like it's necessary to do whenever we have one of these discussions and it gets a little bit touchy. But the point is, is that that's not the function of these seminars. At the end of the day, we're here for an educational purpose. So we're here to learn something and we're here to expand our minds with respect to what it is that we're learning. Now, if some of the conversations some people find difficult, peace, y'all can bounce, it's on YouTube, watch it back whenever you feel like it, cut it, mm -hmm. clip it, whatever, do your thing. You know what I'm saying? Hit me up, DM me if you feel a way about some of the stuff that we say, and we can have a conversation like civilized human beings and we can discuss it. If you don't feel like you want to have this conversation, you can go somewhere else and not have it. But bear in mind at all times, all we're talking about is what's already available in the book. Mm -hmm. I'm not exaggerating, we're not emphasizing, we're not taking anything away. We are actual experts. These are real people who really know what they're talking about. I'm a real PhD. I've really got a book. Like, I'm a real person. She really getting a PhD. This ain't no BS. It's like a real thing. So what I'm saying is, it's, it's for that purpose and that purpose alone. And insofar as that conversation may or may not end up stepping on toes, y'all gonna have to live with it. Apologies. But that's what education and academia is. I, I also want to make a point. You know, Fanon... When I read Fanon, he is talking about the colonial subject. It so, and of course there are, and he talks about them right, like their particularities. Like if you're talking about a colonial subject in the Caribbean versus a colonial subject in Africa versus the colonial subject somewhere in Asia or the Middle East or wherever, there are particulars, right? However, I feel like what he's talking about in terms of race and being other in the colonial context 
mm. is very much universal. 100. And for some reason, at least in, I think in the US, probably in the West, I think, people, the West being Europe and the, and the US um, and Canada and all those places, it seems like people associate the conversation around race only with Black people. Yeah. That makes no sense to me. None at all. Everybody is racialized. And that is what our society is. It's a racial yes. hierarchy. Everybody is racialized. It doesn't mean everybody is racialized in the same way. No. But everybody is racialized. And Facts. to racialize a person other than. So everybody is other. Facts. Particularly if we're not white. But I would argue to some degree white people are also racialized, but as we other type of way. But that's not the conversation for today. Um, but given that everybody is racialized, um and this impact one's life, I think there is so much to be taken from what Fanon is saying. Yeah. He is talking about racialization within the colonial context, to be non white within the colonial context. And also if you look all over the world, you see the impact of this. Like when we get into the chapters where he talks about the um what's it called? The white man with the uh, I'm sorry, the, the black man with the white woman, the woman with the white man. I mean, the things you talk about and the psychological things that are going on here, it's across the board. I see this with brown people all the time. Mm -hmm. The worshiping of whiteness, like all these things, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I think we should keep that in mind. No, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right in everything you're saying. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to what it is that Fanon is trying to get across, particularly insofar as what you said at the outset, we're talking about a man who grew up in Martinique, grew up in, in an area uh, uh, of kind of uh, historical colonialism, French yeah. colonialism, under French colonialism rule. Colonialism and slavery. Colonialism and slavery, of course, under French rule. Um, and then makes his way to France as what he considering himself a frenchman and this is the difference mm -hmm. right so like i feel like one of that's one of the things that's slightly different in the american experience because like if you're yeah. if you're um if you're black in america it's it you, you're you've outside of the fact of slavery so beyond the, the historical slavery you've always been in america you move around in america from state to state to state to state you're an american mm -hmm. um what that means like what it means to be an american is kind of almost up for debate a lot of the time like that's kind of the idea so whether or not america considers itself a racist white nation or whether or not america considers itself an inclusive democratic nation or whatever always seems to be the thing that's fluctuating enough for debate but over in europe uh so for the example with the british experience with the commonwealth it's a it's a different thing there's this sense at least amongst some of the ex-colonial subjects amongst at least some of them that you belong to that commonwealth that you mm -hmm. consider yourself to be part and parcel of that either mm -hmm. European or British experience or whatever. That you're part, you're kind of, you know, you, you belong under the, the, the rule mm -hmm. of the Queen, whatever else. You therefore have the mm -hmm. same rights extended to you as any Brit, any Brit or any Frenchman or any whatever else. Now, any person from any part of the Commonwealth who's come to the United Kingdom or France can tell you how that's just not the case. Right. Um, I feel like you want to say something. I've actually met people who are from former British colonies, which I am from a former British colony, but people from former British colonies tend to have a lot of pride in the British Empire. Like, I have met people from over who they'll be like, oh, we were a part of the British Empire. And I'm like, why are you celebrating right now? That's not a good thing. Yeah. That's gross. Yeah. Why are you so proud? Yeah. But this and I'm just... talking about, I heard this South African woman, a Black African woman, Nigerian. I've heard this from... You know, I don't hear that from South Asians so much. Oh no, I hear it from South Asians. Surprisingly, really, I, I believe it. I could, but I, I could, never come across. Yeah. yeah. 100. I could tell you some South Asians who think it's a great thing that they were part and parcel of the British Empire. And, or at least South Asians who will tell you, I've heard some South Asians tell you that, hey, listen, the British were terrible, but at least they gave South Asia whatever else. You know what I'm saying? Like, thanks to the British, we have, I don't know, roads. Have nothing. Poverty. Poverty is what, what you have. I mean, yeah, but whatever they, they attribute, a red telephone box. I don't know, something that they attribute mm -hmm. to, to what the British gave them. Like, I don't freaking know. But in any case. That melted in the heat. Yeah, right? Yeah. The point is, so so for Franz Fan in particular, we're talking about a man who's born, uh, what, mm -hmm. 1925? 
So he's born in 1925. Yeah, no, I'm pretty yeah. sure he's, he's born in, in 1925, uh, in July of 1925. I forget the exact date. I want to say the 20th of July, 1925 mm. was his exact uh, birthday. And then dies on the 16th of December, 1965. Oh, I um, think it was, it was definitely in 60, I remember that. Yeah, 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 because he dies, he dies young. Um, I want to say, hold on. Yeah, that, in the 61. Sorry, died December the 6th of he 1961. Was sick. He ended up in um, a hospital, I think, in D.C. Because yeah. he had cancer and he was getting treatment in the U.S. With pneumonia. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, so he dies December the 6th of December 1961. So in terms, if you think about that in terms of, in the context of the civil rights movement and in the context of, of what Fanon was writing, when he was writing it, and then versus what was happening in the 1960s in the United States with the civil rights movement, you get a sense of his timeline and when he was coming to the realizations he was coming to versus what was going on in the United States. So born in 1925, dies in 1961, um, and then lived a large chunk of his life, uh, obviously in Martinique and then in France and then in Algeria and mm -hmm. dies in Washington, D.C., where he's, yeah, as you say, he's being treated in hospital there. But the key thing um, for, for us, for our purposes for today, in any case, is the point at which he writes the book. All right, I just want to say, I just always thought that was so weird. I, like, he lived this amazing life traveling the world and then he died in D.C. Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, I know. And ugly, I know. but yeah. It's terrible. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's awful. Um, but all right, so Black Skin, White Masks, this is what we're talking about. Published in 1952. 1952 means that Franz Fanon at the time is 26, 27 years old. Can um, you imagine he wrote this that young? This yeah, 20, I had a hard time conceptualizing. Incredible. Even grabbing which I find. Absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Like this is one of the things that always blew my mind about the guy. The fact that I knew that he that he that the world lost him as young as, as they as he was when the world lost him. Um, and for him to produce the amount of work and the quality mm -hmm. of work that he produced at the young years of which he did it, it's like it's something else. But the truth is it was everyone. Like Jim Baldwin. Yeah. It was Malcolm. It was Martin. It was Facts. Non. It Facts. was, I mean, anyone who, I mean, any of these people that we've talked about so far did all that they did very young. Yeah. But these weren't people who were preoccupied with, um, I don't know, what do you call it these days? Instagram or like, you know, social media or what's popping on Facebook or whatever else. They had a sense of priorities and a sense of, of order that meant more than any of these things. Like you don't see them being occupied with what pair of sneakers are the most fly this week or who's um, trending on, on on Twitter or whatever else. Like I mean, I will just say, I think you can interested in those things and still be a very intelligent person and do things. It just happens that in our society, we don't see that because everyone has a phone in front of their face. The Listen, time. I agree with you. I think so too. I think so too. Like, I think we're, hey, 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 living, breathing examples right here. Yo, what's up though? Real PhD looking fly oh as fudge. But no, 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 no. But Joe said, I think so too. Like, I know you set me up for that because you know it's true. You know, I know you're looking at it. But it's cool. But the point is, I think that's the case too. I think that you could have all of those things. You could do both of these things too. But at the end of the day, it comes down to a very simple equation. Like, there's a, there's a simple matter of time. Um, yeah. And specifically in the case of Franz Fanon, a man, a man sorry, that dies at, at the age of 30, what, 36? 36 years old when he passes away? Something like that, yeah. Um, oh my God, he's a year older than I am. Do you see my point? Like he yeah. passes away at 36, and then you look back at your life and you're like, Yo, what, did you, what have I done? Mm -hmm. He did all of that by the time he was 36, and I right. posted something yesterday that like got mad likes. I've done nothing. I haven't even done that. You see my point? Like it's just not... Today. You did all the pieces there. That is something. That's progress. That's something. You got to eat. You know what I'm saying? You can't think well if you don't eat well. Eh, that's the thing. That's Virginia Woolf. What's up? See? Free okay. gems whenever y'all want it. Just gem gems whenever you want it. Um, I mean, do you want to absolve me of my, my bad eating? I'll accept it. I mean, listen. I, I'm not saying I did it. Virginia Woolf did it. But, like, I feel like she would mm -hmm. understand periods and eating better than I would. So, like, you know, mm -hmm. what, what am I talking about, right? But the point is, so he writes Black Skin, White Masks um, in, in 52 in any case which makes him 26 25 at the time of its publication i'm not exactly sure what month it was published in, but in any case it's 26 25 at the time of its publication and like you said to be writing the way he's writing and saying what he's saying at that age to have that level of lucidity that level of clarity that level of composure at that age i mean look we're not we're not going to do we're not going to go straight into the text right now like we're going to do it in a second i've got a few more things to say in terms of introducing what he was doing but the opening words of the introduction just so we're absolutely clear right just to see what he did in terms of his 
clarity and calm when he says the explosion opening words to quote him the explosion will not happen today it is too soon or too late i don't come with time as truths my consciousness is not illuminated with ultimate net radiances nevertheless in complete composure i think it would be good if certain things were said and these things i'm going to say not shout for it's a long time since shouting has gotten out of my life and it's that man it gives me chills fam like every time i read that intro i get chills up my spine because all he's trying to say is this is past this is past rhetoric this is past shock value this is past trying to be um even academically impressive this is past me just trying to get your attention and this is past me trying to say something that i think may or may not be the case i'm talking from a place now where we got to be serious like it's time to get serious now like i'm talking from the depth of the pit of your soul now like let's get real now mm. it's past all the bs and the jokes and da, 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 da. now we for real for real now it's ain't no shouting type thing and for well, him okay i feel like that's like his version of make it plain yeah yeah you know I totally like agree. i don't have to yell i don't have to scream this is just what it is and this I'm is just what it is yeah i totally agree with you. so we're talking about a man who who let's begin from the top right i feel like I, let's let's start from the top and the thing that that for me was was i think personally and I, i'm not a france fan and expert there are france fan and experts out there i just love the man so like please feel free to correct me if somebody wants to correct me i want to jump in jump in i'm not an expert in the field i'm just brown <laughs> so you know <laughs> but um in europe refugee what's up <laughs> but with a phd but the point is um for me the 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 the, the crux of it is and i know it's not quite in the introduction but it's early on in his life is when he describes his arrival to france and the shattering experience of for the first time in his life being seen as something other than french or at right. least oh sorry even further not just other than french but completely unacceptable as a human being by mm. what at the time it was a young little white girl blonde mm. hair blue eyed white girl mm -hmm. And he says that he remembers he's wearing French uniform at the time. Mm -hmm. My man's dressed in French military uniform. Wait, he wasn't in the French military. He said he was dressed in formal French military, not military uniform, but formal like uniform. But well, why would he wear that if he's not in the? That's weird. I mean, I don't know. The point is that so he's dressed up formally, right? Turns up he's walking around in Paris, and this uh, young girl sees him from across the street, and she's there with her mother. And she pulls on her mother's arm. She pulls on, on her mother's like shirt sleeve and points him out. Instead of saying a man or what have you, she uses obviously the, the racial slur, but she says a black man. Mm. And in that moment, he says he suddenly realizes he's not who he thought he was. The whole identity, the framework, the construct of his sense of self that he had kind of developed over the course of 20 odd years of life that has made him who he thinks he is growing up in Martinique, mm -hmm. educated, so on, so on, so forth, gets completely and utterly shattered in one instant at the mm -hmm. words of a young girl. That's all it took. Do you think the shattering was just that he was not a friend? Or do you think the shattering was that he was not being seen at first? Wait, you have to run that one back for me because like connection isn't great so ask me that question again. what was what was shot what was shot was just the illusion that he was french or was it was was what was being shattered by his man because when she she looked at him like that and she said that she's demonizing she is and i think so i don't know which one he's referring to He's talking about, you know, his illusion that he's French or his idea his belief that he's French. But I wonder how much of it has to do with the second thing. I think, I think it's majoritively the second thing. I think that what he's talking he about is the shat. Yeah, I think so. I think it's the shattering experience of being dehumanized altogether. Like, I don't think it's just losing a sense of national identity. Like, that's a thing. Um, yeah. That's certainly a thing. But I don't think at the level that he's talking about in black skin white masks when he's describing what he calls a psycho existential trauma mm -hmm. a psycho existential not psychological a psycho existential trauma he deliberately ties it into Jean-Paul Sartre which we can talk about in a second but what he calls a psycho existential trauma doesn't just this we're not talking about the level of, of personal identity we're talking about the level of 
ontological identity. So without being too philosophical and technical, what that means is the nature of your whole sense of self. Mm. So beyond like whether or not you think you're British, French, Arab, black, brown, whatever else, mm. beyond that, the fact that you think you have a self at all, mm. that you exist as a self, as a meaningful subject, as a self mm. of some description, though that description is up for debate, but of some description. That's what I think he thinks is, is completely taken away from him. I remember, so the reason I asked that question is because I experienced me in something that my dad told me that happened to him. Mm. When my dad, so my parents were married, they lived in London. Mm. My mom obviously grew up in the UK. My dad's not, and he was there. He said he remembers walking, he was trying to go somewhere, and he was looking mm. for an address and he couldn't find it. Mm. And he stopped a lady, an English, a white English woman on the street, and he asked her, Excuse me, can you tell me where this picture is? And she Bit at him and walked yep. away. Yep. And that sounds he familiar. said he was so shaken, like it just shook his sense of who he was. And when he finally found the building and walked in, he was so like shocked that somebody would do that. That people in the building were like, "Are you okay?" Yeah. Like what happened? And it, it just because it's like to grow up in non-white country. I mean, I can't imagine what that's like because it's never happened. I've never yeah. been. I've never been up in a country where I'm the majority or whatever or or whatever like, this, but like um I can just imagine what it would be like to grow up in a, a country where everyone looks like you or where you're where you, at least where like whiteness is not a thing in the same way then go to a white country a majority white country and to experience that I would imagine that yeah it would shatter your sense of who man of who yeah. you are as a person. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent. No, one hundred percent. And I can I can empathize with your father's experience. I grew up in this country. I didn't. I wasn't born here, but I grew up in this, in the mm -hmm. UK too. And I know I've had experiences exactly like that. Like you know what it's like taking your shopping home from the local supermarket when all you've got is a bunch of like immigrant vouchers that you go use and go to wherever mm -hmm. to get your food with because you ain't got no cash because you can't have a job because you're not allowed a job because you're a refugee still. So they don't let you work. You don't have a passport. You don't have nothing. You've got to rely on the state to, for you to eat anything. So you go and line up at the supermarket. And then when you're paying, you're paying with your crappy vouchers. You can't read what none of it says because it's in fine print. You don't read no English. Um, are you trying to figure all this out? And now everybody in the line thinks you're some kind of like whatever. And on the way home, you've got to be spit at and abused all the way home carrying your, 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 your shopping, like just trying to get home. Like that experience for me, mm. like as a young, a young boy mm. and not knowing the language. Like you understand, not knowing that like, walking around in, the, in those streets, not knowing a word of English with my mother and my kid brother, like in that environment, being spat and da 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 da, -da treated that way. Yo, that experience for me was like, it was terrifying, fam. Absolutely fundamental. Because you feel like you've come to a place where not only is it that you don't belong, you almost don't exist. You're almost, you're on a par with the way you've seen people treat, treat cats and dogs, fam. Mm. Like dismissively like indifferently at best and, and then at worst is they only see you there so they can toy with you. like they have no interest in you as a human mm -hmm. and so for so when when Franz Ferdinand describes that experience of having his whole sense of whole sense of self shattered by this young girl I was like no I know exactly what that I know exactly what you're talking about I know exactly what that is like I see mad white people look at me like that and how many times someone says Packy I know exactly what that means mm -hmm. but he says it here himself look he says it here himself at the risk, I'm quoting again from the introduction, so we know we're not veering off, but he says, at the risk of arousing the resentment of my colored brothers, I will say that the black is not a man. There is a zone of non-being, an extraordinarily sterile and arid region, an utterly naked declivity where an authentic upheaval can be born. In most cases, the black man lacks the advantage of being able to accomplish this descent into a real hell what he's saying is he's describing that like when you when you dehumanize somebody and render them what you call black or other or like whatever packy whatever you want to call it but when you, you do racialize that, them more. when you racialize them as a colonial subject as an other as a demeaned other as a lower other when you do this to well as non-white right well that's as non-white yeah exactly hierarchy, that's what that is so be exactly. non-white to be less than facts that's exactly what it is and when you do this to somebody else it's not so much that you provide them with an identity 
that that's other than your own so it's not as though you're saying to them okay you're not white but you are this and you give them something else by which they can refer to themselves or have a sense of society or civilization or what have you you strip them of any right to have any sense of identity whatsoever or humanity whatsoever and then they have to make for themselves what remains like you have to pick up from the debris and the detritus whatever remains to recreate or compose some sense of a frankenstein self and then you got to walk around like that with confidence because you got to get a job and like you got to teach and you got to do whatever else well similar to the u.s in my opinion particularly the history of black americans in this country right where historically from day one black americans were dehumanized and yeah. literally did not come as human beings yeah were told that in every way yeah and then had to still live and had to create some sense of self from something you know yeah um so it's interesting that in that way the experience i guess the overall experience of being othered or being racialized yeah um, yeah yeah mm-hmm. No, I totally agree with you. And I think mm-hmm. that, that the key thing, so, all right, so the key thing that I think is trying to, that he's trying to address and the thing that makes this so controversial and so difficult to mm-hmm. discuss, that makes Fanon so difficult to discuss, and we'll talk about the women angle later on because we'll get to that and it gets even more complicated then. But I think the thing that makes Fanon so difficult to discuss, particularly today, especially off the back of the conversation that we had last week, is the fact that he's he's trying desperately to see beyond and speak from a place that's beyond the boundaries of uh, binary kind of like either racial politics or any kind of politics whatsoever. He's trying desperately to speak beyond the boundaries of just black and white, of just right and wrong, of just whatever else. It's we're trying desperately to get beyond that simplistic binary reduction of what it means to be a person. Because as far as I've understood, again, I might be wrong, somebody correct me, but as far as I've understood Mm -hmm. from what he's trying to suggest is the second you buy into that narrative from the outset, so Mm -hmm. you're either black or white, you're either this side or that side, it's either da-da-da-da-da-da. The second you buy into that narrative, you immediately cut off from yourself the avenues that should be afforded you to express the full sense of your humanity, Mm -hmm. right? The full sense of what it means to be a, a, a person, whatever that is. Of whatever type and description and gone as whatever else. And I'm not talking about, let's be absolutely clear here, because I don't want to turn this into to like more identity politics. I'm not talking about taking away racial racial designation so that you can free yourself to one day, uh, one day I could be black and one day I could be brown and one day I could be whatever and one day I could be no, that's not what that means. Like <laughs> that's not that's not what that means. But what it means is for you to in like um to what inherently, intuitively, introspectively understand and drill away and plug away the depths of what it means to be a person the full sense of your humanity the full Mm. breadth and scope of what it means to be a complete person it's that Mm. and i think that's what's been what gets denied from everybody those are the the, the kind of angles and the avenues and the possibilities that get denied from everybody whenever it's a simple black and white conversation like you either fall into this camp or you either fall into that camp, and it's like well, it's not it's not only that. I think that's what categories do in general, especially the way that we use them here, because here you are only what you look like. Yeah, you are only your skin color, your facial features, whatever category people racialize you as. That yeah. is, your, there's no and and from that category, people will infer all kinds of things about you as a human being. Yeah. He says at one stage, I mean, exactly to that to that effect, or exactly to that point, he says explicitly at one stage, I believe, in the introduction, I believe that the individual uh, should tend to take on the universality inherent in the human condition. Mm. I, but hold on, let me just run that back again. I believe that the individual should tend to take on the universality inherent in the human condition. See, for me, this speaks to the thing that we were speaking to last week and the week before that and God knows whatever else, this issue of like racial brotherhood or this issue of a sense of a sense of brotherhood across all oppressed, all colonialized, all suffering peoples and what have you. This idea that we all have access. This is what I think Malcolm was getting through to with Islam. We all have access to that human, that universalizable human condition. The fact of your mortality, the fact of time, the fact of of suffering 
the fact of loss, the fact of pain, the fact of joy, the fact of love, all of these things are universal human conditions that speak to no particular race, no particular creed, no particular gender, no particular age, no particular culture, no particular religion. They speak to no distinction or discrimination whatsoever. We're talking about conditions of being. Like we're talking about what it means to be as a human being. And that's everyone. And you have to begin speaking from there. Like and we, that everyone, yeah, sorry, no, no, that's go ahead, everyone, go ahead. and it includes white people. Facts! It's not only oppressed or people who are formerly colonized, Facts. black people or brown people, whoever. It's literally everyone. And and I know there's a lot of people on all sides who are going to be mad at this. All the nationalists, the white nationalists will be mad, the black nationalists will be mad, the Arabs will be mad, the, everybody's going to be mad because everybody thinks that they're particular and special and they are different from everyone else. But the reality is, you are different from each other. We're all the same. We're literally all the same. And I mean, look, we could reality. listen. I'm all down for insofar as a person wants to say that there's going to there's a necessary practical and political distinction to be made between black and white and until certain things are, are met and certain boundaries are checked we can't break from that fam I'm black the hundred all the way down I'm all the way down with that I'm, if it's gonna if you're gonna split it down like that and what we're gonna say is hey there's a whole bunch of white people out here who are just shooting anybody and everybody out here who calls themselves or considers themselves black guess which side of that fight I'm standing on I'm eating bullets all day okay, long so I'm gonna say something. I see what you're saying, and I would have said the same thing. And I do say the same thing in the sense that I'm always gonna be on the side of whoever is the most oppressed. One hundred. But whoever is catching hell right now. Yeah. And I'm gonna be on the side of what's right. However, I'm a person first. Yes. I'm, say I'm a human being first before I'm a you know. And I think most people don't say that. I think that's I don't true. Meet a lot of people that say that. Everybody has a label that they give themselves first. But, but, I think, just, I, but that's also I like nationalism of any flavor. I don't think yeah. it's. I understand why people go in that direction. Yeah. But it's not a place you should stop. You have to go beyond that. Go beyond yeah. nationalism. You know? And I feel like that's what he's trying to get at. But hmm. I mean, he says it in one particular stage. He says, in an age where skeptical doubt has taken root in the world. It becomes harder to penetrate to a level when the categories of sense and nonsense are not already invoked. Mm -hmm. Again, let me run this back again, just so we can, you know, battle rap. <laughs> run it back, just so we can explain, so we can really make sure we get every word of that. Because my man is like, that's some deep ish. But in an age, and I think this is still true, true today. He's not talking about an age that was in the 1950s. Like this is right. the case today. He's talking about the modern era, yeah. Yeah, in an age when skeptical doubt has taken root in the world it becomes harder to penetrate to a level when the categories of sense and nonsense are not yet invoked bless you bless corona like a like a corona all over your face yeah really um say it again i'm gonna say, say it again. again no i'm gonna say it all again because like why not we can repeat okay. france fan until we I mean, blue in the face go ahead no, we can repeat Franz Fanon until we blew in the face. It's Franz Fanon, fam. I just say his like a mantra over and over again. I don't care. Um, in an age, in an age when skeptical doubt has taken root in the world, it becomes harder to penetrate to a level when the categories of sense and nonsense are not already involved. What that means is because this idea of, of one and the other, because this idea of self, because this idea of, uh, of doubt of anything else based on the certainty about who I am, this dual binary existence that we live in as a consequence of thank you to Descartes and everything else. But precisely because of that, because that's the case, it's very, very difficult to have a conversation with somebody who doesn't already start with a, sense of, with a set of boundaries and barriers that determine what they will and won't accept. What does and doesn't mm. constitute a sense or nonsense. They've already got a set of parameters that determine, okay, well, this is what's truth and this is what isn't truth. And if what you're saying doesn't fall within the boundaries of the things that I've already accepted to be true, then I don't, I'm just not buying it. So mm -hmm. it's the same, you know, you, I mean, the extreme end of this is your QAnonist, right? So like, you know, if you, you could tell them all kinds of sense all day long, but unless you tell them there's a lizard person that's trying to take over the world, they don't believe in anything you said. Right. It's just, I don't believe nothing you said, because it doesn't, it doesn't fit within the parameters of the, the, the belief system I've already established well, that's for myself. Ideology. We're talking about ideology. That's exactly ideology. what we're talking about. Yeah. It's the framework which you see the world and you cannot break with it. Right. That's how you, you become ideological. 
And the dangerous thing, and this is what I mentioned beforehand, the controversial and danger, we've mentioned this already a couple of times, but the controversial and dangerous thing that Franz Fanon is trying to do is take the issue of race beyond ideology. Mm. He wants to extend this racial experience and the, the experience of what it means to be othered by another human being beyond the boundaries of a particular racial ideology. Mm. So beyond the boundaries of a particular uh, racial group or beyond the boundaries of a particular racial experience or what have you, but as the experience of, of the othered people, spoken admittedly from the perspective of a man who he's seen as and considers himself to be black spoken mm -hmm. clearly from that point of view and there's no shame or hesitation or doubt in right. it. Mm -hmm. but and with the respect that look i mean he says it himself it's not as though he could speak from the algerian's point of view i'm not algerian right yeah he can only speak from his perspective yeah yeah i'm not algerian what do you want to tell you but that, what does that mean that the algerian experience doesn't include oppression and suffering because right. i'm not algerian what, what are you talking about yeah I'm not Algerian. I don't happen to be an Algerian. Me, me personally, I don't happen to be an Algerian. Nor do I happen to be from Martinique. Nor do I happen to have been born and raised in Harlem or the Bronx or any of these things. But every single one of the heroes that we've talked about, whether it's Franz Fanon, James Baldwin, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, any of these people or any Algerian revolutionary in the, in, in the Algerian independence war, all of these people speak to me a particular way, regardless of my personal experiences or theirs. Right. Because they're speaking to a human condition. Mm -hmm. And I'm attuned to it because mm -hmm. like you were saying, I switch on as a human being first. I don't wake up as an Arab. I wake up as a, a person. Mm -hmm. I wake up as a human being, like a being. And I, I don't mean that. I mean that philosophically. Y'all need to step up your philosophy game. That's why I'm here. Oh, Y'all need to step up your philosophy. No, for real, because it changes the way you think about the world. You might understand one, two things because I'm a human being. What I means is be hyphen dash ing. Not a human being as a noun. Think about the difference. This is what I mean. Not a human being is a noun. Uh, you're a human being. I'm a human being as a verb, fam. I'm being it right now. Got it. I'm being a human right. This is this is human right now. This is me right now. This is what it is. I make the smart. I make the smart idea. Yes, I make very smart. Yes. <laughs> Oh but it's, it's problem because Dr. Yashmesh, he said uh, women have a uh, brain size of squirrel. <laughs> All right, Borat. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Very nice. <laughs> no? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my wife. She's very nice. Soon I will have no wife. <laughs> a Borat. Oh, God. Yo, listen, can we not step on Borat's Funny. experience of oppression and injustice? Borat has suffered his experience of oppression Borat and injustice. Is, okay. Oh my God. Just, if you haven't seen the second one, please watch it. It's hilarious. I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those who not haven't, you, you I'm to... talking to people who, are, who might be watching it. If no you facts. haven't seen Borat 2, watch Borat 2. If you're facts. somebody who hasn't seen Borat 1, watch Borat 1. Facts. And don't be like the morons in the movie theater when I went to go see it who walked out in the first scene because they were offended. Hey. No, Borat One was great. It was such it, he let Americans be Americans and just show the world what kind of Borat One was amazing. It was great. Borat One is away. Listen, 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 listen. Errol, Errol could jump in on this next week. All right, Errol, we'll deal with you and your Borat hate this week. Okay, we'll do that next week for this week. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, look, the point Errol, is, we're gonna deal with your Borat hate next week. I will deal with your Borat hate next week. I, listen, there's, there's, listen. I'm not happy with the racial undertones here in this conversation, okay? I'm just I'm just gonna I'm gonna be the one to register I'm gonna register this, okay? I'm defending God. Borat's right to suffer the same way we all suffer, okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, going. Come on. No, fun all right. Fun on, fun on, fun on, fun on. But what I'm saying is um he's speaking from from a depth of experience that, that addresses the question of the human condition as a verb not as a noun fam. so not yeah. a human being as as a definitive static thing which requires definition and then insofar as it's static not only does it require definition but then it has criteria for what will and will not pass as a human being there will be specific yeah i got something high there will be specific criteria for what will and will not pass is it if i start crying after this it's not franz fanon okay i did my crying over franz fanon. rub it I did, I did my friend crying over france Banner, okay but my point is it's not it's not uh uh if i have a human being as a noun then what ends up happening is i can determine what does and doesn't qualify as a human being i can determine the definitions of a human versus if a human being is a verb as a verb as a doing thing 
then whatever I'm doing qualifies under the the kind of criteria of human. All of it. It all qualifies as human. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter whether I'm black, brown, left, right, up, down, gay, straight, woman, male, whatever. What does that have to do with anything? Mm-hmm. All human. And it's that particular experience that he wants to extend his analysis into. And this is the beef that he ends up having with Jean-Paul Sartre. And I feel like mm-hmm. Franz Fanon is, is having like, there's one, two little digs at Jean-Paul Sartre in this introduction. I don't I don't know anything about art. See, what I say? See when I say you got to step your philosophy game up? I'm just going to make you mad by calling him Sartre. Sartre. That's is what that, everyone in America calls him. No, no, no. Is this, is this like you were trying when you tried to make all of France mad when we were there and you were like, oh my God, is this Notre Dame? Nope, this is on Notre- Where are the football players? I don't see no <laughs> football players. This ain't the real I, I Notre Dame. I did not say that. What I was, I screamed, I'm here, Quasimodo. I'm here. You did actually scream, I'm here, Quasimodo, <laughs> out loud. Part of a in the of like, kid. Wherever we were in front, in the middle, just out loud. I hear you crash your Yo, unbelievable. Unbelievable. But in any case, just so you know, like, sound mad educated over here. Sound super educated, mad like PhD'd up, whatever else. We running around in Notre Dame. Is this new new team? I'm here crashing my This is what our life is really about. This is really happening in my days. We pretend we read. Ain't no reading happening. But no. So my point is, well, look, this is why I'm saying we've got to step up, step up philosophy game, up, right? Because there's this debate that happens between Jean-Paul Sartre and Franz Fanon and Simone de Beauvoir falls on, on Fanon's side of the debate. She leans on his side of the debate. She thinks he's... I think he's, you'll find the way you pronounce her name is Simone de Beauvoir. I think you'll find the way you pronounce her name is Simon de Beauvoir. But this... <laughs> If we want to be accurate, I'm just saying, if, if the intention is to be accurate, it's Simon de Beaver. <laughs> Listen, can I tell you a true story? Can I tell you a true story? The only reason... Listen, no, but the only reason that I ended up calling her Simon de Beaver is because I, I, when I was first introduced to Simone de Beaver... <laughs> Yeah. Somebody gave me a book and the E had gone missing on Simone, so it said Simon. Yeah, okay. So in my head, as a young yeah. kid, I didn't read the book. I, I just saw you. Simon. And when I lived like, the rest of my life, I lived my life thinking that the name was Simon. And then when I saw it, it was Simone, I was like, oh. And I was making jokes with my friend and we were like, yeah, who do you think I name was? Simon the Beaver? And I'm like, all right, I'm sorry, bro. It's Simon the Beaver. <laughs> Listen, is Simon de Beaver? It's 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 fried rich Nisho. Oh yeah. Fried rich Nisho. I prefer Nietzsche. Oh Nietzsche? But Nietzsche sounds like too Czech. Now you're getting actually European. Who cares? Nietzsche. You, Nietzsche. Friedrich Hagendas Nietzsche. There you go. There you go. That's my favorite ice cream. I know, but it's not a word. It doesn't mean anything. Um mean something it means great ice cream to me. no no that's that's what they meant it to mean that's what is well, the only thing it was supposed to be it was a great ice cream mm-hmm. no but yeah so fried rich niche niche um simon de beaver there's a few of these um and john john paul sart is always saying john paul sart mm-hmm. Sart. that's what we're gonna go with sart um, all right all right so in any case look they have a debate between two. We're not going to go on about this for too long. I just want to wrap our heads around this idea of, of what the issue is so we can really try to get to grips with exactly what Franz Fanon is doing. Because I don't want us to come away from this thinking this is um, a purely political racial discussion. It's much, mm-hmm. much more than that. And I don't think Franz Fanon intended it to be for just a purely political racial discussion. It was much, much more profound than that. And the debate was this. For, for Jean-Paul Sartre, without going into a long discussion about Jean-Paul Sartre, he, his primary um, concern was freedom, but what it meant to be a human being, right? Mm-hmm. He's trying to describe the nature of what it means to be a human being. And in order to do that, you have to dig past all of your kind of like material concerns. So you've got to dig past, you know, your hair color, the music you like, the country you're born in, your gender, da, 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 da. We're talking about something way deeper than all of that stuff. Cool. Franz Fanon believed that the question of, or the issue of, of racial othering, right? That uh, experience, that shattering experience of identity we described at the outset, he argues that that, phenomenon should fit under the category 
of the understanding of kind of human of the human condition it's part and parcel of the human condition that this is part of what it means to be a human that you could shatter your sense of identity mm -hmm. jean paul sartre disagreed jean paul sartre for all of his talk about anti-semitism for all of his talk in support of, of, of franz fanon he wrote an introduction to a couple of his books for all of that jean paul sartre didn't think that the issue of race dug down that deep that as far as he was concerned, it was a slightly more material issue. You could deal with it at a certain level, but it didn't speak to the philosophical depths of what it meant to be a human being. So was it like a Marxist? Was he a Marxist? Who, Jean Paul Sartre? Yes. Okay, so this is the typical Marxist argument. Yes. About race. Yes. It doesn't matter. It's just another thing. The only thing that another matters. construct you have to get past. Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. Mm. And in some respect, the weird thing is, is that in some respect, that is exactly what Franz Fanon is saying. He is saying that race is a construct you have to get past. But what he's he's trying to make you understand is the experience of doing that on whether you're white, black, brown or anything. Mm. The experience of doing that is a human experience across the board. One and two, that the experience of doing that, particularly as a colonized subject, particularly as a black, brown, mm. whatever, whatever, whatever person is wildly different and requires a much, much different uh, uh, mm -hmm. set of uh, further experiences mm -hmm. to deal with, to unravel, to untie, to God knows whatever else. It's a much, much more complex process where he says at one point um, that there are, I'll tell you what, hold on, hold on. He says, I, want to, I don't want to get this wrong, so you might have to find this. Sorry, you might have to talk while I try and find this. But at one point he says mm -hmm. that there are two, as far as he's concerned, that there are two causes um for the experience that he's talking about as being uh, um, uh the inferiority inferiority complex of the black man right mm -hmm. i found it he says if there is an inferiority complex it's the outcome of a double process primarily mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. subsequently the internalization or better the epidermalization of this inferiority and then he continues to talk about how this is a socio-diagnostic problem it's not an individualistic problem and then goes on to say that the, uh, the, the black man must wage his war on both levels since historically they influence each other. Any unilateral liberation is incomplete and the gravest mistake would be to believe in their automatic interdependence. Mm -hmm. Besides, such a systematic tendency is contrary to the fact this will be proved. Yeah, yeah. But the point is that you have to deal with both things. As somebody who's as a, uh, a black man or somebody who's a colonized other, that you have to wage this war on both fronts. You find yourself yeah. in a position where you have to deal with the economic, political, social, ideological realities of every single day life. But that also has a direct, deep, profound impingement on your sense of mm -hmm. identity as a human being. I think this is what James Baldwin was speaking to. Like that well, fundamental sense of self. And I think this is why decolonial movements and movements for liberation go in national direction. Yes. They have to be nationalist in nature to begin with because you uh, deal with this question. Yes. Of race. Yes. Of being othered, of being non-white, of being whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I understand why it goes in that direction. And I'm talking about for everyone, not only people who are formerly colonized, but if you look at in the U.S., mm. the Black nationalist movement, the, na the white nationalist movement, mm. the reason that people go in that direction is for this, because when you, our society, look at you as solely your race or your race category, whatever thing they put you in, you have to deal with that first. Yeah. People go in that direction first. Facts. But this is why I say that if, if when you get stuck there, you lose the second part of that, the second part of the Fact. fight, what Sean was talking about, you know, the Fact. becoming a human being. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I think most of us, we just get stuck there. If you look at uh, movements, if you look at movements in the US, um, everybody gets stuck there. Yeah, I think that's what's happening over the course of- But it's not any, but it's not the fault of people, it's of individuals. It's be, you're living in a society that doesn't let you get past that, it feels like. I, no, I agree with you. I think that's the case. I think mm -hmm. the, the, the overall, the overarching structure of the way, particularly Western societies are, are, are built, the way they're constructed ideologically, the foundations, the ideological foundations of Western society are dualistic. Let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that's a big sentence for mad people, so let me break. The ideological foundations of Western society are dualistic. What that means is ultimately and fundamentally, everything boils down to a binary issue. It is or it isn't. It's real or it's not. It's fake or it's false. It, it's fake or it's true. It's, it's whatever. It boils, everything will boil down to a binary position, fundamentally speaking, me and everything else. The internal, the external. What's mine and what's outside. 
And what you do is other everything that isn't me and everything that's internal to me is the only thing that, that, that's, that's valid and true. I mean, this is we've had this conversation mad times before and I hate to keep harping on about it, but hey, I'm the philosopher, that's why we're here. Look me up, what's up? But um, it's this idea, it's the Cartesian idea of skeptical doubt. And it's the thing that... that, um, that what did you just say? No, but we see don't the see don't Cartesian the what Cartesian idea what of mean? skeptical doubt. That's they gotta explain that. Descartes, mm. Cartesian, Descartes. Um, you're not to be, huh? That's you're not be, yeah, right? I think I just I don't you gotta say it again, be or not to be, no, to be oh. or not to be a Shakespeare. Oh, oops. <laughs> to be or not to be is Hamlet, fam. No, oh, I never even read that book. I think, therefore, I am, is Descartes. Oh, that's one, yeah. To be or not to be is Hamlet. Okay. Descartes was trying to figure out what it means to be. Or no, how do I know that I be? Mm. That's what he was trying to figure out. It's not to be or not to be, is how do I know if I be? Okay. And what he said was, so long as I think I be, then I be. Okay. But the problem with that argument is if you're being, if you be only so long as you think you be, then you're the only be that can determine what being means. Okay. If you're the only person that can determine what it means for anything to be real, or that can verify the reality, the truth, the goodness, whatever else, what that means is you fundamentally divorce yourself from the contextualizing matrix of your life. That is to say, you divorce yourself from reality. Your whole reality is dependent now only on you. But that is the case anyways. And there Because your perception is what creates your own reality. Meh. Something can be, look, look, there's a truth and then there's the way you see it. There was, that's true, absolutely. But what we're saying is that there was a time before you were born. Mm. Yeah. That there was there was a time before you were born and there'll be a time when you die. Mm -hmm. And that you, you, entered into uh, a phenomenon that isn't wholly dependent on your being mm. that you are as much subject to influence as you are capable of influencing these things okay. are much more complicated than it looks okay so that whole granted you're right in the sense that the whole sense of self altogether that whole sense of your identity altogether is a fiction granted but that's something else insofar as whether or not uh the sense whether or not reality as such is dependent mm. on your criteria is where it gets a little bit crazy but that's Descartes mm. how do we get hit how do I how do I open up Descartes because you said something and then we went on a rabbit hole I don't know all right what I said was the entire history of western civilization or the ideological foundations of western civilization are dualistic or based on duality I mean, they're trainers, so, right yeah. yeah so and so far as and so far as that's the case what we end up with is this I the other type debate and as a result I think this speaks to what you were saying a moment ago as a result we never really complete that journey so you could start with a nationalistic trend which feeds into that I and the other mm -hmm. argument it's just the opposite side of it and it mm -hmm. feeds into that particularly when it's anti-colonial when it's independent and it's a struggle for revolution and so on and so forth but at some stage you're supposed to break beyond that but that means you have to be able to do that dual work which you means have you to have break to have the idea of self really and right. you just have to realize that there's no self, there's only the universal. Right. And I think, I think, I don't, this isn't, this isn't where I was planning on wrapping a seminar up. I feel like we should wrap it up in a second. But I think the, the, um, the thing that Fanon is trying to get across. How do I put this? No, nah, you know what? Let's leave it. I'll leave it. Okay. No, I'm, I'm going to leave it for next because I feel like I'm going to open up a whole subject and I don't want to do that. I'm going to leave it for next week. Okay. Um, or for the next seminar on, on France Fanon. Yeah, we'll that's that not going to be next be next month. Next month. That's next month is conversation. We'll come back to France Fanon next month. Mm -hmm. But for now, we're going to put Fanon away um, with the introduction. But to just bear in mind this idea that, oh, that's what I want to say. This idea that we have to start thinking from that, that condition from the human condition. We have to begin our thoughts from there as opposed to beginning our thoughts from whatever we identify ourselves as, that we begin from that place. And that there's two means and methods by which to do this. There's standard, normal, read a book, enlighten oneself, get an education. I don't know, turn on an odd seminar here or there on a YouTube where you, you know, 
meet a fine Arab with a great lineup, whatever else, good looking Bangladeshi on the other side. I'm just saying, but you could do that and get education. Alternatively, you could have, you could suffer the kind of traumatic identity shattering experience that Franz Fanon suffered and open yourself up to a whole slew of abyssal inquiries that you wouldn't have to suffer if you weren't um, subject, a subject, a colonized subject. And I think that's what it is. What he's trying to say is it doesn't, we have to have this conversation because it shouldn't have to be the case that you have to suffer that in order for you to start thinking like this. We shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Particularly speaking to the colonized subject, particularly speaking to those people who suffered under oppression and gone as well else. More than anything else, I'm gonna just say this. Let's close on this. Let's close on this. Hold up. Because exactly. this pizza is sitting right here, and all I'm doing is looking at that now. I know, I know. I heard your stomach from over here. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's just close on this. He says in the intro of the intro. This is important. Because I feel like it's important for our seminars. He says, Why write this book? No one has asked me for it, especially those to whom it is directed. Well, well, I reply quite calmly that there are too many idiots in this world. And having said it, I have the burden of proving it. And that's what we're here for, fam. Like, I feel like that's what these seminars are here for. You know what I'm saying? Now, you know, we there's mad stupid I people agree. out here. There's too many idiots in the world. And we're trying to, like, educate you back into a level of kind of, like, intelligence that goes over us. But you know how it is, man. I don't know what to tell you. In any case. So, part of my platform as a is a rich lady. Part of your, part, wait, part of your, what is it dictator to do? What? My platform as a dictator yeah. Yeah. is to get rid of the idiots. How do you intend on doing this? It's a secret. Like, because I feel like this, it's a secret. Oh, God. You sat you next to me. You vote for me and then you'll know. I know it's the it's 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 the Trump brand of like uh, policies. What you're saying is like you'll find out, okay? You'll find out. I don't know. You'll find out. Come back next week. You'll find out, okay? <laughs> it's, I'll tell you. It's dictator today. Right. In any case, hey, look. Point is. Thank you all for coming along. It's been another open seminar. This was Dr. E's Thank open seminar number 47. Thank you all for coming along. Thank you, Mama, for being here for it. Thank you guys for putting up with a couple, one, two technological problems, a few internet connection issues. We'll have all of these resolved soon enough. We are making our way to 52 and everything is going to be clean and pretty and good as well. Else. So thank you all for coming with us on the journey, mm. building together. You know what it's all been about. But in any case, Dr. E's open seminar will be back same time, regular scheduling, same place next week, Monday, 7 p.m. GMT, 2 p.m. EST. I'm your boy, Dr. E. That's been your girl, the great dictator, Tanzine. Bye. Thank you guys for coming along. Thank Much you. love to everybody. Hey, stay masked up, stay safe, stay healthy. Y'all get your vaccines if you can get them. Get your parents vaccinated. Look after each other. Please stay safe. And in case anybody was wondering, Black Lives Ben matter, Black Lives still matter, Black Lives will matter. That's just what it is over here. It's just always what it's going to be over here. Anybody got a problem with that? I speak to you no time, never. Peace. One. Love to everybody. Thank you, man. Bye. Peace and health.